In mid-April, students at Columbia University launched a Gaza Solidarity Encampment to demand that the university administration disclose all investments in Israel and companies that benefit from Israeli apartheid and genocide and divest these holdings. This brave action by the students sparked an international movement, and students across the world have launched Gaza Solidarity Encampments demanding that their universities and administrations do exactly the same. In many cases, these encampments have been brutally repressed and some administrations have even declared that they will definitely not divest from Israel. However, in other universities, students have had important successes, winning divestment, disclosure, and other victories. In Belgium, at the University of Ghent, hundreds of students launched the Gaza Solidarity Encampment over a month ago, and recently the university administration announced that they would be ending some key academic ties with Israel. The encampment continues as students continue to raise more demands for the university to fully divest and stop normalizing relations with Israel. And for this conversation, we are honored to be joined by Ming Chu Wang, the president of COMAC in Ghent, Belgium, and a master's student in conflict and development at University of Ghent. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited. Well, first, let's talk about uh, what's been happening at the university. Uh, when did the encampment start? What was the key motivating factor? And what are the demands of this encampment? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think, first of all, it's really important to state that this encampment was launched by a coalition of two independent organizations, uh, namely Ghent Students for Palestine and and Fossil Ghent. Uh, and so I've been participating since the beginning, uh, but it was launched by this coalition. Um, and so the encampment started on the 6th of May. So that's already from today on exactly one month ago. Um, and yeah, it's been it's been really crazy. We've been there for an entire month now. Uh, and the students are still encamping and camping until today. Um, and so the students decided to do this encampment because especially since the 7th of October, there have been many, many actions from both students, but also staff um, that organized actions, participated in actions, but the university did not listen. Uh, we've been asking for this academic boycott for months now and they haven't done anything. And that's why, yeah, students decided that we needed to take a step further and to do more. Uh, and that's why the encampment um, was launched. Um, and the thing is that the, so even though the encampment was like the ID was has been breeding for many months, the moment that it was launched, it was also the moment that in the United States, there were many encampments starting. And so I think that really led to this yeah huge wave of momentum that we also got in Ghent, uh, where the entire media jumped on it and uh, mass reported on it. So I think that created a huge momentum here. Um, and on um, the demands, so... Our specific encampment here in Ghent has two demands, actually. Um, on the one hand, it's on releasing a time-bound plan from the university on how and when they will cut all ties with Israeli institutions. Um, and the second demand is actually a demand about sustainability. Um, and it is that the university also launches a time-bound plan on how they will achieve their own sustainability goals. Uh, and it's because the students see that there is an inherent link between the struggle for free Palestine and uh, the climate struggle. Um, so, yeah, I think it's been really a huge movement. And I think we can even compare it to the historical movements of the students back in the days, you know, when they were protesting against the war in Vietnam or against the apartheid in South Africa. Uh, so I really think that this is such a historical movement happening here. And uh, many of us are just realizing that because when you're mid in the middle of that, it's kind of hard to, you know, zoom out, take a step back. But uh, I think it's important that we all realize that aspect. It's definitely historic. And I think the international character that you spoke to is also one of the historic elements of this. Um, but, you know, specifically, what role do universities in Belgium and across Europe have in being complicit in genocide, um, you know, uh, contrary to U.S. institutions, which are huge private universities with these massive endowments, um, a lot of the universities in Europe and especially the ones where their encampments are actually public institutions. Um, so can you go into a little bit more about 
the role of these universities uh, in being complicit with genocide and in uh, Israeli apartheid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that even though these are public universities, they are still very complicit uh, in the genocide and the ongoing colonization. I think, first of all, because they have many different collaborations, many different ties with Israeli universities and companies. Sometimes these are bilateral, so one on one, but often they are within a multilateral cooperation. So, for example, the European Horizon Europe project, um, for our university. University of Ghent, the only ties that they have are within Horizon Europe. Um, and so there has been so much research done and evidence brought to light that all of these universities and institutions are complicit, not only in the ongoing genocide, but also in the um, illegal colonization. I think uh, Maya Wint's book, Towers of Ivory and Steel, that has been uh, yeah, gaining so much popularity in the whole world. I think that book is a really good place for people to start if they don't know why these institutions are complicit. Uh, I think she gives a very good account on, on why this is. Um, and I think it's also, so it's the, the tie that they have, but also the fact that Israel is so institutionalized in European collaborations, like the way that they're not even a European country and they have access to European funds. I also recently learned that Israel is a country that receives the fourth most uh, funding from Horizon Europe, which is crazy. And they're not even a European country. Um, so I think that is really important. And I want to bring it back to the victories that we've had in Ghent uh, and also to explain and why they're so important. Um, so the University of Ghent decided to cut ties with all Israeli uh, universities, uh, which is huge because obviously they're all complicit. But another thing that is often forgotten is the fact that Ugand also uh, pledges to try to push Israel out of all the European uh, associations like Horizon Europe. And I think that is really huge because uh, the university also pledges to take a leading role uh, in achieving this so that they will also contact other uh, countries and partners to join them in this struggle. And I think if we could achieve that, if we could get Israel out of these European associations, that this would be huge in isolating Israel on the international scale, because I think that is the role that we have in the imperial core uh, is to isolate Israel and to denormalize working together with the Zionist apartheid state um, that it is. Well, those are definitely uh, important victories. Um, and I think it's important to also talk about how you won them. Uh, so what do you think allowed for the encampment to win its demands? And what role did political organizations have in supporting the students in their struggle? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that there are different aspects to it. Uh, I think, first of all, the encampment was such a broad movement, like really, really broadly supported um, amongst normal students, among civil society, but I think most importantly, also among the staff of the university. I think that was a very important population to activate. Um, for example, the students launched a open letter in the beginning of their encampment, which the rector did not respond to. Uh, a couple of days later, the staff launched an open letter to which the rector finally responded. And then after that, the students and the staff drafted a new open letter together. And um, around that time, there were like 60, 70 staff members that actually came to the encampment to sleep there. Uh, and then in the days after, they also stayed to work there. Uh, after that, like a lot of things came into motion. It was like the week that the rector finally came to talk to us. It was the week that we also got the first victory of cutting three ties with Israeli institutions. So I think the support of the staff was also very important, uh, but obviously it still came from the students. So I think that's the first aspect of having a very broad movement. Um, I think second of all, we also had a very strong case with a lot of evidence in the sense that there were many students and PhD students that did a lot of research on these specific ties and why they were um, yeah, complicit in human rights violations. Um, and I think because of this, 
we had a very convincing story as well to the broader public that we're not just, you know, a bunch of students that don't know what we're talking about. No, we have a strong case with hard evidence, also backed by academics like Maya Wint, uh, who actually came to the University of Ghent to give a lecture. And then she came to talk to us uh, to help us with our case. Um, so that was such an amazing experience. So I think that is a bit of the second um, factor. Uh, I think the third is also the fact that there was uh, a radicality of the movement uh, in the sense that, you know, the fact that the students have been encamping the largest building of the university for a month now, I think that's pretty radical. And uh, there were mo uh, more um, other radical actions, like they occupied the rectorate as well. They did banner drops uh, on all different faculties of the university. I think all of these different radical uh, direct actions also put more pressure on the university and the broader uh, society uh, and also gains a lot of like momentum in the media. So I think that's another aspect. And um, I think the fourth is that the encampment created a lot of creativity. It was really like a breeding breeding spot of creativity. I think there were the students that have been participating for the past months, they have learned so much, so much on, on social movements and how to organize. And we saw that there were so many students that for the first time took all kinds of initiatives um, on their own to solve all kinds of problems. And uh, like, for example, like they started a spontaneous art installation and people started all kinds of actions uh, all over like the university. And I think with this, we shaped a whole generation of students um, learning them how to how to fight for a better world and to fight in general for a better world um, and taking all these creative initiatives. And I think these are experiences that they will keep for the rest of their life and also impact um, the, the course of their lives. Um, and because of this creative energy, I think this is also the reason why we could stay there for so long. Cause you know, it's, it's exam season and uh, people are busy, yet we're still occupying. Um, so I think this is also a energy that, you know, keeps us, keeps us together and keeps us going. And uh, I also think on the question of the political organizations, um, obviously there are political organizations present there and supporting the occupation, but they are not leading it whatsoever. And uh, I think also for me, I'm there to support. I'm there to support the students. Um, and I think it's really great to see that it is such a broad movement with people with all kinds of different political views. And I think that's also the beauty of it, of the unity that we have as a student organization, um, a student movement there, that we can get so many people together who might, you know, believe different things on different aspects, but that we can bring them together on this case of Palestine and academic boycotts. And I think this is also one of the strengths that we have there, that it's such a strong and broad unity of all different students. That's really amazing to hear. And I think that the experience of students across the world who have been participating um, in this in this movement, um, engaging in struggle for the first time for many people, learning new things, it's, it's really inspiring and incredible to hear. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I guess just for the last question, you know, the student movement is happening in a context of broader mobilization of Belgium society. We've seen these incredible mass marches, tens of thousand people on the streets of Brussels, but also of other smaller cities across the country. Um, we know that in a lot of countries that have been Israel's historic allies, this turning of the tides has happened where uh, it's losing its social base, it's losing its you know historic basis of support. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people of the world are actually standing with Palestine in a way they haven't before. So can you talk a little bit about broader Belgian society? Um, what has been happening with the movement, um, the growth of support for Palestine that we've seen over the past eight months? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that there has been a huge shift in public opinion, which is really crazy to see the way that um, Belgian media reported on the 7th of October is so vastly different than how they're reporting on like um, on Palestine right now. Um, and we're really seeing the line shifting. Um, and 
On, on broader, um, broader mobilization, I think the civil society played a huge role in the past months in um, organizing people from, you know, many different political views even. Like there's so many people like, you know, left wing, but also people who are more centrum or, or even a bit more right wing who just see all of this injustice and see this ongoing genocide. I think the civil society has been so important in uh, mobilizing them. Um, for example, there is a, yeah, a coalition of civil society organizations that also launched a petition uh, for a military embargo, uh, which is crazy that we still do not have it, like after eight months of genocide. Uh, well, for Russia, it was like, you know, within, within a week, the first sanction packet was already there. Um, but so I think this um, this petition already has around 12,000 uh, signatures already, and um, they went to hand it to um, the minister, Haja Labib, um, to ask her uh, why there is not yet a military embargo. Uh, and obviously they're framing it that, oh, no, it's the regions that have to decide. And the regions are saying, oh, it's Europe. And Europe says, it's no, it's federal. So, you know, they're all pointing at each other on why they shouldn't do it. But I feel like the people are not believing it anymore. And I think it's so important that we, um, yeah, try to gain more conscience within the broader population on this uh, on this topic. Well, that's it's really incredible to hear. And, you know, the student movement at the University of Ghent has definitely inspired people across the world, the mobilizations of people in Belgium, really amazing to see. Um, well, thank you so much for joining us and we'll definitely be following what happens with the encampment uh, as, it, as it continues in these days. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me.